Mohamed Namazi is an artist, researcher and educator based in London. In 2019, he completed a PhD at UAL uh, Chelsea College of Arts with a subject emphasis on digital humanities, exploring the notion of encounter within networked culture. His interdisciplinary studio practice manifests through means of decoloniality, deconstruction, collaboration, process, unlearning and telematic systems within social and cultural realms. Mohammed is a member of the Critical Practice Research Cluster and a visiting lecturer at UAL. His writing has been published by Intellect Books and he has previously exhibited at venues such as Neon Digital Festival, the Baltic Centre for Contemporary Art, Berlin Transart Triennale, The Barbican and Flat Time House. Mohammed's presentation is called Listening Back to the Archives. The text that I will be reading is an extract from a piece of writing that reflects upon my experience as an artist researcher while working at the Decolonizing Arts Institute. When walking within the aisles of an archive, aspects of the past feel much closer to us. Contrary to the experience of reading history through the textbook, archives and collections invoke knowledge through actual objects, items, and artifacts, ready to be touched, seen, and felt. Archives, present themselves as the living embodiment of the past with the capacity to be reintroduced into contemporary context. But what if part of the past is absent, suppressed and unrecognized in the archives, creating a void in cultural representation? The discourse between cultural memory and coloniality underpin the position and the line of inquiry in this presentation. The interwoven correlations between the two, in addition to my duo ethnocultural lived experience, set out the objectives and interest for an archival investigation with the aim of testing the role of archives as the embodiment of a collective cultural representation. My entry into the project was shaped through an inquiry that explored Michel Foucault's engagement with notions of archives in the archaeology of knowledge, where the relationality of objects is described as the basis for the construction of knowledge, and Franz Fanon's articulations of the principle of decolonization in a dying colonialism. Through these channels, I became immersed into various UAL archives, observing multiple collections, surveying an abundance of material in hopes of uncovering traces of the unknown or unheard. The goal was to explore how one finding could lead me to other discoveries, aiming to map a network of connections of ethnic minority cultural practitioners. The necessity for this approach is located in my presence as a stranger to the collections and the need to establish a connection, a procedure that included a felt duration, exploration and discovery, but more importantly, the need to earn the right of hospitality. It is this necessity that Jacques Derrida refers to as the main concern of the stranger which can only transpire when, I quote, the question of hospitality is articulated with the question of being, end of quote. In this context, the dual ethnocultural aspect of my being as a minority member of society shaped my reading of the archives, providing a space to inquire the right of interpretation, intervention, and hospitality. Over a period of two months, I established a strong connection with the British artist film and video study collection at Central St. Martins, 
brought together by Malcolm Lee Grice and David Curtis in 2000, the collection embodied a significant example for experimental moving image and related publications in the UK, covering a period of mid 60s to late 90s. However, and perhaps unsurprisingly, the level of diversity, especially in relation to Black and Asian practitioners, appeared to be minimal. Nevertheless, examples such as Death Valley Days by Gorilla Tapes, Handsworth Songs by Black Audio Film Collective, and I'm British But by Grinder Chatha established a rich content for the research. These videos facilitate the possibility to revisit the social and political unrest in the 80s as well as providing analysis for the early cultural integration of Black and Asian communities in the UK. Additionally, from my perspective, coming to the archive with a fresh eye on British artists' films, these examples provided a framework for re-examining socio-political discriminations and prejudices of a recent past with the antagonism relayed via the state that are witnessed today, for example, the Windrush generation. This is seen particularly with Hansworth songs, which uncovered images, stories, and the reality about the Hansworth riot in Birmingham in 1985, following the death of the black woman, Cynthia Jarrett, and the white policeman, Keith Blakelock. It's the 11th day of September, 1985, and the Home Secretary is standing in a Hansworth street with confused eyes. The masses saw him struggle for composure, and they heard him mutter to journalists, These are senseless occasions, completely without reason. Somebody said behind him, The higher the monkey climb, the more he will expose. You can see the problem. This well-known and discussed film essay frames the discontentment of the Hansworth community and a sense of disconnection from the mainstream politics of the time, a situation similarly described by George Floyd's killing and the consequent protests in the US and around the globe. In Hansworth songs, we see interviews with the Hansworth communities, snapshots of newspaper headlines, refilmed archival footage, and a poetic, sonic, and visual epitomizations to enable the film not only to represent the frustration of the Hansworth community, but also the oppression felt by generations of ethnic minorities. <music> He said to her, remember Bunny Enriquez and Greta Bork and Lady June Barker? Remember Countess Koblanska with her black velvet top, her skirt or figured net over satin? Remember the nights of Karuba cocktails and Karuba sour, their secret pregnancies, your wet nursing and me nappy washing? It's about time we had our own child our own Master George Hammond Banner Bart. That night, I moved from an idea to a possibility. I was born in a moment of innocence. Similarly, connecting the work, Listen Gallery organized a screening of Hansworth songs with an online discussion panel to review the relevancy of the course of events in the film and the social unrest in 2020. In the presence of the director John Akomfra, one notable point raised by Echo Eshon, a writer and curator, 
raised a question about the effective use of footage of statues for the opening scenes of the film and the emotional power they carried. In response, Akomfra, as the voice behind the collective, described this practice as a criticism of political falsification of values rather than pure historical representation. I quote, there are certain commemorative values which are not merely to do with the historical, mythic, symbolic, etc. A lot of that is just to do precisely with this business of figuring out a way in which the statue becomes a falsification, a defining semiotic language for describing the best of us or what we are brilliant at. Akonfra's assertion in relation to the falsification of cultural values placed in the embodiment of some statues has not been unrecognized from the recent global demand for racial liberation and as witnessed in Bristol led to the overturning of such figures. The doubling effect of this engagement from the archive to the present reinforces the semiotic oppression hidden in such statues, inherent in the stratifications of Western colonial power, and often enforced through the utilization of media to outclass and eclipse alternative cultural values. For generations, and again today, the content of news and media has echoed a language of soft racism that filters into common usage. There was a committee which looked at it and said that if we went on as we are, and by the end of the century, there'd be four million people of the new Commonwealth or Pakistan here. Now that's an awful lot. And I think it means that people are really rather afraid that this country might be rather swamped by people with a different culture. And you know, the British character has done so much for democracy, for law, and done so much throughout the world. But if there's any fear that it might be swamped, people are going to react and be rather hostile to those coming in. For a British nation with British characteristics, every country can take some small minorities, and in many ways they add to the richness and variety of this country. The moment the minority threatens to become a big one, people get frightened. Media prejudice was frequently the subject of criticism for the scratch video artist collective Gorilla Tapes, whose work intended to raise awareness in the public. The group were influential through their ironic, inexpensive political tapes, mainly made by collaging old movie footage combined with TV news content. Included by David Curtis in his book, A History of Artists, Film and Video in Britain, the collective described their intention as a strategy, I quote, to reveal the true message behind the manufactured mediation of news and politics. End of quote. In Death Valley Days from 1984, a satire that criticizes the Thatcher Reagan era and their special relationship revealed the colonial imperialist manifestos that lay behind the superficial liberal faces and slogans. Would probably have touched on ambitions and hobbies and what they wanted for their children and problems of making ends meet. And as they went their separate ways, maybe Anya would be saying to Ivan, wasn't she nice? She, she also teaches music. I love music. I love music. Music. Love music. And I love just pottering around the house.
As much as Hansford songs highlights the socio-political concerns rooted in colonial legacies, the documentary on British but presents other sociocultural aspects of Black and Asian life in the UK and the manifestation of cultural diversity as understood in the 80s. Grinder Chatha's film utilizes recordings from interviews and documentation of quotidian events to reflect the social dynamics of the late 80s in Southall, a suburban district of West London, representing the gradual cultural exchanges between Asian and British communities in the area. I see myself as a uh, British. Maybe, well, Welsh, I suppose. I'm Asian. As soon as I walk through the door, you see I'm Asian. Northern Irish is how I would describe myself. And uh, I'm very happy with that. I would prefer to be described as a Scottish Pakistani rather than British. It's got the British groove in it, it's got the Asian groove in it, and it can even have the North African groove in it. It's got more, all the continents there. Hinting on some positive aspects, I Am British But engages us with a narrative that introduces a successful process of intercultural exchanges and progressive social integrations, a notion defined by Homi Baba as cultural diversity. Homi Baba analyzed this process in his essay, Cultural Diversity and Cultural Differences, I quote, as an epistemological object, culture as an object of empirical knowledge, end of quote. To further analyze this through Chatra's film, among others, one particular section of the documentary gives voice to the then young British Asian musician, Harun Shamsher, who explains the inspirations, origins, and the rationale of composing Bangla music, a fusion between Punjabi folk and Western pop, as a youth movement initiated in East End. I see music as being a good, a good mainstream is to put your feelings across, and this is how I do it. I'm mixing together Bengali music, folk music, and, and West music, and making people appreciate and actually forcing them to dance to our music. You know what I'm saying? Yes, until about four years ago, I was, I was a real British person, you know. I didn't know anything about my own culture, my roots, you know, Bangladesh, you know. I didn't come from, even though I was born in England, you know, I had uh, a long background. And uh, there's a lot of people like that out there, you know, like me. And what I'm trying to do is I'm learning now. I'm, you know, I'm realising that I have got roots, you know, and it's quite nice. I've got a nice feeling out of that. I'm trying to make every, other people out there understand the same thing as well. Shamsher's strategy in his music practice acts to reconcile audiences from different cultural backgrounds, to which, in Derrida's terms, is 
seen as an attempt to earn the rights of hospitality in a dominant culture. His methods of mixing music enacted an intercultural exchange through sonic interventions. Whilst this is a strength in Shamshar's work, there is a risk as stated by Baba that cultural diversity, I quote, gives rise to anodyne liberal notions of multiculturalism, cultural exchange, or the culture of humanity, end of quote. Discussing similar social and political themes with Mitra Tabrizian, a British Iranian artist and filmmaker living in the UK, Tabrizian indicated that the positive influence she gained from the process of immigration transpired in, I quote, observing both British and Iranian cultures from an outsider's point of view, end of quote. As an Iranian living in the UK, I relate closely to Tabrizian's experience. The duo ethnographic experience certainly deepens and diversifies one's cultural understandings. However, it also positions one as a stranger and not only to the hostland, but also to the homeland. Channeling this observation, Tabrizian described the notion of strangeness and its manifestation in her photographic series, Borders, that portrays Iranian immigrants in a prolonged state of waiting. After interviewing volunteers for their participation in this series, it appeared to her, I quote, they all feel as if they have unfinished business and thus the question of waiting, end of quote. Through an imaginary idea of home that is distant from reality and is in contrary to a pragmatic analysis, Tabrizian captures the metaphoric challenges faced when one feels to be a stranger to a dominant society. In my exchanges with Tabrizian, she described this condition as to represent a state similar to, I quote, waiting for Gado, as well as a state of in-betweenness, end of quote. This space of undefined enunciations, a feeling of in-between and waiting, originates an unfulfilled sense of belonging or recognition. Nevertheless, it does not remain at an individual level. It expands and applies to the formation of cultural values and the recognition of what is considered as value and knowledge. It is this line of inquiry that establishes the role of archives and collections to be vital as an educational institution. Providing the means of public consciousness for cultural recognition and awareness. Discussing these contexts with Jun Jivani, a Guyanese born curator of Pan African and diasporic black cinema living in the UK, Giovanni expressed the difficulties she encountered during the 80s and 90s when she began to introduce black cinema to cultural scenes and institutional bodies in the UK. By engaging with curatorial projects such as the Third Eye Film Festival in London, in 1983, her 40-year-long career contributed to multiple aspects of diasporic Pan-African and Asian cinema. In particular, Giovanni collated the very first edition of the Black and Asian Film and Video List in 1988, which was realized as part of a commission for BFI. Asking about her long curatorial practice and her lived experience. Very often you are in a, you are in relation to the central tenets and the central institutions, institutions in the widest sense, 
of of uh, cinema, whether it's festivals, whether it's um, cinema genres, whatever. You're always on the outside and being compared to what are regarded as the central tenets of that. Giovanni's testimony loops us back to the notion of strangeness. When a voice seems strange to dominant cultural values, the confrontations in challenging those central principles forms the enduring process of decolonization. This process in any non-inclusive system, for example, archives, is hidden in the restless and continuing hopeful search to attain the rights of hospitality, leading to enabling the dissemination and distribution of alternative cultural values. The process of educational and cultural liberation is clearly perceptible in Giovanni's collection, partially in residence at Mayday Rooms. Currently, in search for an organization to host the collection permanently, and equally importantly, to preserve the anti-colonial ethos of the collection for the generations to come. Giovanni's project demonstrates the importance of working towards creating discursive collections in archives and their role in pedagogical praxis with the capacity of portraying contributors collectively. As seen in these works, engaging with processes of decolonization can only be effective through a direct dialogical interaction with those excluded from any society. It has to be materialized through their understanding of value, ethos, and knowledge to give space for alternative voices, resulting in retracting the process of colonization into liberation. Paolo Freire, an educational theorist and anti-colonialist thinker, referred to this framework of dialogical interactions as critical for the process of decolonization. In his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he emphasized that the dialogues between the oppressor and the oppressed must entail action and the content of these exchanges, I quote, can and should vary in accordance with historical conditions and the level at which the oppressed perceive reality, end of quote. If the dialogical process of engaging with any minority does not entail common reflection and action, as Freire describes, it will only result in pseudo participation and not committed involvement. Through this channel, we can succeed in retracting colonial stratifications, not only in the archives, but in the wider socio-political dimensions of collective living. Thank you. So Thank we're you. going to uh, move now to the last conversation and Q&A of the day, moderated by Judy Wilcox. Judy is head of the Museum and Study Collection at Central St. Martins and a senior research fellow with an interest in object-based learning and the pedagogical potential of archives. Judy is also interested in museums and archives as spaces for well-being, social justice and representation and works with a wide range of community partners. Thank you, Susan, uh, for that introduction. Uh, can I just check that everybody can see and hear me? Yes. Hello, Judy. Super. Hi, Mohammed. And thank you, Mohammed, for a really rich and interesting presentation. Um, and having worked with you for a number of months now and seen the expansiveness of your research and your engagement with the archives, I know that what we were able to look at today was just really a small part of um you know what what we've talked about sorry to interrupt again folks mohammed could you um stop sharing your screen please oh my god sorry i'm spaced thank out thank you no worries thank you okay so hopefully that's all working now so there are so many threads 
that I've drawn between your presentation, Mohammed, and the presentation of the other researchers and so many routes I would really like to go down. But I think I've narrowed it down in the first instance to one question. And I, I think it's really interesting that two of our researchers wound up settling on artists' film from the 1980s. So that period was a period of great ferment and social injustice um, and resistance. Um, and I know from some of the thinking that Stephen Ball and I have done around artists' film as a discipline, uh, we have this notion that perhaps because artists' moving image was a relatively new discipline in the 70s and 80s, uh, so it was kind of the Wild West of fine art practice. It was unclaimed territory. Do you think that artists film was a medium which was particularly well suited to this kind of challenging, resistant artwork? So artists like a Comfra or the Gorilla Tapes Collective who were really trying to use their work to question the status quo? Absolutely. I think um they uh, made a, a great use of uh the medium at, and the technology at the time uh, uh and and in a way i think that kind of uh espe especially with gorilla tapes and the kind of really inexpensive way of making uh their work uh, sort of uh, i think fits in this uh context very well because it's a kind of, I see it um, as a maker, I see it as a kind of, um, uh, in a way, in a kind of, uh, uh, I don't, uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of, you know, it's a kind of recycling the media and give it back to the colonial uh, discourse. Uh, so in a kind of uh, way, they sort of, um, Basically, I think uh, Gorilla Tapes uh, um, uh, practice worked very well, but also uh, uh, with Hansworth songs and Black audio practice, I think uh, this kind of, as, as one of the early uh, sort of uh, films that is a kind of, in a way, it's the beginning of this kind of essay film, uh, archival, uh, sort of refilming archival materials and, uh, and in a way, again, very inexpensive, very sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, down to earth, uh, sort of, uh, but precisely, very um, directly and right to the point uh, to uh, uh, to criticize the system and make uh, uh, sort of appropriate points. Uh, so yes, absolutely, I think that was a great uh, sort of. Uh, success for these uh, artists. And that really brings me to the second thing that I wanted to ask you specifically about, which is that you've chosen films by makers who were in a sense also making an approach to the archive. Um, so both the Gorilla Tapes film and the John Acumfer film are a mishmash or a collage um, or a scratch of these multiple different um, visual resources mm -hmm. um, so effectively that they were approaching a film and television archive and remaking it and you've talked a lot about your journey as a as a stranger in the Derridian term uh, coming into the archive and I wondered whether you felt there was a reflection in the artists that you were working with you know it's almost like a mo an endless moibus strip so you're looking at somebody who's looking at the archive um, in their work and you're an artist yourself coming into the archive um, did you think about their journey as a as a perhaps a stranger in the terms that you've discussed? Uh, yes, I felt, uh, I mean, one interesting experience was that when I was going through these uh, films, uh, I could connect to the feelings of uh, the makers um, at the time and the social injustice that were going on during the 80s. And this kind of uh, responsibility as an artist that you feel that you need to do something about it through your practice. And somehow, uh, again, you know, recycle the material that you are bombarded with uh, and uh, add your criticism 
through uh, your ways onto them and give it back to the society. So I think um, I, I connected very well to um, the, the main intention, the, the intention of these uh, artists and, uh, and in relation to the uh, notion of strangeness, uh, I mean, in with with um, there are a few subtle differences because, for instance, uh, with uh, uh, black audio, with Hansworth songs and um, on British pot, you can see uh, the uh, sort of uh, that kind of. Um, uh, aspects of strangeness and the fact that the artists want the filmmakers they want to bring this out and and make their point through the channel of strangeness and make them and make themselves and their community and the social injustice that's going on in the society familiar to the public but with gorilla tapes it's slightly different because gorilla tapes they are white artists and they are uh, sort of um, they don't come from that kind of idea, uh, kind of cliche idea of strangeness as a foreigner, because they are uh, uh, British, and uh, and in a way um, through the. But you know something that is really interesting, and and I really wanted to use gorilla tapes. The reason that I couldn't, uh, the reason that I actually uh, uh, encouraged me to use their work was that. Artists like Gorilla uh, Tapes, artists collective like Gorilla Tapes, they are, uh, in fact, the people that, um, through uh, uh, writings like, um, you know, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, uh, that uh, Paolo sort of uh, referred to, is uh, is do basically references those people that are part of the community, but they see the struggle and they talk about it. So from, uh, and they sort of, you know, they don't, uh, they, they basically bring out those issues and they try to uh, uh, sort of create a kind of um, diversity in a way and a level of understanding that can relate to the ethnic minority. So I think um, uh, artists and collectives like Gorilla Tapes are, uh, and their practice are very valuable because it's a voice from the dominant uh, culture that comes in and says, we see these things. Thank you so much. Um, I can't see any questions in the chat or any hands up, so I'd really like to bring in some of the other researchers um, to see if you have any questions for Mohammed um, or any points you wanted to raise about the presentation. Um, and I did wonder, Anna, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but whether you might want to say something as a researcher who was exploring reasonably similar territory and that you were you were both looking at 1980s films from the film and video study collection i wondered if any of those parallels um with muhammad's experience that he's discovered also rang true for you yes uh thank you uh thank you for your presentation um uh, the one thing I wanted to mention, I, you may already be familiar with, is this uh, text by Stuart Hall called Gramsci and Us. Mm, um, I haven't well, read it. Okay, but well, I think you would enjoy it. And also because I was looking at um, the clips of uh, Thatcher in, in the videos as well. But uh, in the text is so fascinating because he's thinking about Thatcherism as a historical project, as an ideology that is progressive and regressive at the same time. Um, and he makes such an incisive uh, critique of the left to conceive, you know, an alternative vision beyond proposing certain certain policies. So I think it's very interesting to think about politics as production, as a as a cultural transformation, like that's how Hall sees it. And the way that you're speaking about, you know, counter artistic production, or in the case of Honduras films, um, the production of identity within representation. Mm. Yes, uh, absolutely. I think 
from that perspective, um, I somehow got engaged with Bahapa's um, notion of cultural diversity, the conversation that we had uh, in your presentation. Uh, and in a way, the reason that I asked that question was because it could relate to my um, uh, what I looked at within my research. Uh, so, yes, I think um, uh, in in I mean in sort of sort of the looking into the kind of this process of decolonization, and if we want to sort of uh, see that uh, actually uh, in a kind of practical uh, manner, I think. Uh, uh, I mean, what, what I tried to link was this kind of uh, idea that uh, Freire in um, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed sort of pinpointed as the under uh, under the educa pedagogical under the education system, and uh, I wanted to make this link between the archive and their um, uh, agency in education. Uh, and then through that channel, uh, try to uh, basically um, uh, bring this idea of uh, direct dialogue uh, with the oppressed. And within that, uh, you know, the uh, observation of cultural diversity and the uh, position of ethnic minorities uh, within, within that. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, sort of see uh, how we can somehow uh, uh, bring in some uh, actual change or think about methodologies that might bring actual change. Thank uh, you. Um, did either of our uh, researchers who haven't yet spoken have something they wanted to add? Oka or Elisa? Yeah, I'll go after Elisa. I think you had your hand up first, Elisa. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. thanks a lot, Mohamed, for the, for the presentation. No uh, and I, I know it was unintended, but it was great that you muted Margaret Thatcher <laughs> there, so <laughs> thanks for doing well, it. <laughs> I, I, can, I, can see, I can see the beauty of that, but I have to say I'm gutted about sort of losing all yeah. the sound. I, I think this was a pity actually to lose all the music part, you know, because you point out like the importance of sound and of course the yeah, uh, Black yeah. Audio Film Collective is called Black yeah, Audio yeah. Film Collective. Yeah. So there is the, the, the importance there and also with the Chandra piece. Uh, and I think like that the kind of sonic dimension of the archive through dub or through other sort of music so it, has been very, very important. But there was something else that I wanted to pick up on coming back to this uh, idea of hospitality uh, and like, you know, I, I really like the, the way in which you think about like hospitality within the archive as a researcher yourself. And so kind of asking mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to be granted that, that kind of hospitality. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came to my mind was like uh, um, poet and artist uh, Banu Kapil. Uh, who published like a, a really uh, great book that is called How to Wash a, a Heart. And I wanted just to uh, like uh, read a very short passage uh, because I think it, it, it's it's really great for, for, you know, it really resonates very well with, with sure. what we're uh, speaking Thank about. Thank you so much. And, and she says that it's exhausting to be a, a guest in somebody else's house forever. And I think that that's what you had you know, trying like what you are very well kind of pointing at uh, through the presentation, through the artists that, that you uh, have looked at uh, and thinking about all, how all these things are still present in, the, in our society today. I mean, Windrush, uh, you know, the Windrush scandal, there was a deportation during the night uh, of, of people to Jamaica. So this mm. is, you know, something that it's so, uh, you know, the hostile environment is so like, yeah. yeah. So I, I just, uh, yeah, I just uh, thought if you wanted to comment on that. Sure. No, absolutely. I think, um, you know, in I'm British, but by uh, Chatra, there are so interesting examples uh, that it shows how cultural diversity uh, actually 
it sort of embodies the idea of cultural diversity from my perspective and how it, I mean, how it can actually give birth, how, what's the pro process of giving birth to cultural diversity? And uh, I think uh, through the example, uh, example of Harun, uh, Harun's music, I think, um, uh, I think the, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, I see it, uh, I see Harun's work uh, as, as, as a kind of practice and a challenge to earn that right of hospitality, to come into a dominant culture and say that I have things to offer from my roots from my roots, things that come from me. I mean, uh, I I was uh, planning to play another clip, but you know, the sound wasn't working. So I sort of, uh, but there is a part in the film uh, that I really recommend uh, for everyone to watch that Harun says that, you know, up he says something like this, I paraphrase, he says, you know, I was uh, uh, only, a year ago, or a couple of years ago, I was just a British person, you know? I didn't know anything about my roots, you know, Bangladesh, where I come from. So now, uh, and then he says that uh, I'm uh, basically learning now through that in order to uh, understand who actually I am and how I can um, basically introduce new uh, music uh, to the UK culture scene through that uh, channel. So I think this idea of, you know, I mean, uh, there are so many things that we can talk about this, but I mean, the idea of hospitality, I think in a way um, can be seen pr uh, dominantly in Har Harun's work. Thank you. Um, so Oka, I'm very aware of time because I know yeah. that Susan always likes to finish as, as close as we can. But please, if you would come in uh, with your final points, that would be super. Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Mohammed. Um, my, I had, um, I wonder if, you, you. if, you, if you've um, read Kavita Banot's article, Decolonize, Not Diversify. And um, I, I think I have been uh, sort of scheme that at some point yes yeah and and so I, I was wondering about the interplay of those two words decolonization and diversity within the context of your presentation and perhaps how different artists or movements have interpreted i know this is like a big question for the end um but that was my so uh, just to understand it uh, probably so the differences between decolonization and diversity no i mean well the article talks about those differences, but I was wondering about the interplay between how artists or cultural theorists use those two words and, and how you yourself use those two words in dialogue with each other or in relationship to each other. In your sure, yes. Uh, so this is um, a really interesting sort of uh, subject in terms of um, pinpointing the differences between cultural difference cultural differences and cultural diversity from and then the position of uh, decolonization within this uh, because uh, uh, there are uh, obviously I mean there are we have uh, it's a challenge for uh, 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 for a maker or a writer or uh, whoever wants to somehow think about the possibility of uh, cultural integration and exchanges um, and at the same time maintain that uh, idea of tradition. So, I mean, I, I think I somehow um, can relate to this concept of how the tradition uh, in any form of culture progresses and uh, one generation move um, sort of uh, one, one generation's point of view sort of alters to the previous generation. Uh, and that, I think that's something that applies everywhere. But uh, when we come to um, uh, works like Harun Shamsher, that um, there is um, this um, danger in a way uh, of, you know, I, I had two clips, uh, clips in this uh, film 
in, in my presentation. The first one was about um, a singer uh, that represents the traditional way of Bengali music, and then Harun's uh, come comes in. Harun comes in and introduces a kind of uh, new genre in Bengali music. So then uh, there there is this kind of conversation that although that Harun's practice is really interesting and people might like it, but the uh, counter argument is that it's basically destroying the tradition, the traditional uh, Bengali music. Uh, so I think this is a kind of um, debate that, uh, you know, uh, it's an interesting debate and conversation, but I think the process of decolonization in relation to this uh, can basically, uh, uh, I think, I think these uh, processes are integrated within the process of decolonization, and it's a bit uh, hard to uh, pull them out and uh, uh, sort of uh, think that because I think um, in in any way cultural um, integration and exchanges happen, uh, and uh, I think it's a kind of inevitable. Um, maybe process, uh, but yeah, I think, I, I don't know if I have answered your question, but uh, I, I tried to hint on some uh, points. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed, um, and thank you to all of our researchers for such an interesting exchange, as indeed it was after each of the the various presentations I feel like one of the great one of the really invigorating things about this project has been seeing the way you interact with one another and riff off each other and share uh, source material uh, and articles that would be interesting for each other's work and um, so it's been great to see the way you've you've all worked together so I'm going to draw this session to a close and hand back over to Susan who I know wants to wrap up the day. Thank you so much, Judy and Mohammed and everyone. Um, it is hard to wrap up and let's just say we're drawing to a temporary close. Um, we've had some incredibly rich discussions provoked by your critical, creative, meticulous uh, decolonial approaches and moves, um, Oka uh, upturning and turning up of the caption as a ubiquitous hierarchical ableist practice. Um, meta and macro archival amplifying, threading and unraveling, refusing homogenization and silence, as well as refusing disclosure willed by others. Elisa's micro dovetailing of separated and segregated archival bodies and narratives, the meticulous fashioning of an agonistic joining, jarring and flaring of occluded histories, along with the unjoining of their hegemonic counterparts. Anna's close attention to provisional, conflicted, and perhaps risky intersectional positionings in and through the reading of Onwara's work, inviting the ongoing living, breathe, breathing passage of ideas over the settling of ideas, and Mohammed's listening back to the archive, bringing voices and gestures and interventions into complicated dialogue and play, whose voices and sounds uh, today were ironically and interestingly muted, perhaps for some painfully so, for this muting and silencing heightens their and our exhausting, as Elisa said, estrangement within and without the archive. So it's been an incredibly rich and quite a long day too. Um, on this note, I would like to invite um, everyone to, to join me in, in thanking our colleagues across the UAL Library Archives and Special Collections, Sarah Maherta, Gustavo Grandal Montero, Stephen Ball, Judy Wilcox, our Institute colleagues behind the scenes, Claire Pattenden and Hannah Rowe, and most of all, our researchers in residence, Karani Baroka, Elisa Adami, Anna Gonzalez Rueda, and Mohammed Namazi. Thank you all so much. And thank you. Thank, so you. thank you so thank much, you. Susan. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.